so let's get into the history of mood rings. By the way, we've all had one before, right? Like you guys must have owned a mood ring at one point or at least like touched one before? I mean, even me as a 25 year old adult, I'm still like fascinated by them. Anyways though, let's talk about the history. The mood ring was invented in 1975 by Joshua Reynolds, who took an incredibly simple product idea and turned it into a national craze. What's crazy is that they originally sold for $45 if you wanted it to be silver plated and $250 if you wanted it to be gold plated. And now in today's Today's day, you can get them for like a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. They're super cheap now. I guess when they first came out into the public, they wanted to seem like this fancy, expensive, cool product, and then it was just, it was too much money. Millions of rings sold in just three months, coming to a total of 20 million in sales in its first year. So you could definitely say they were kind of popular. I mean, people even had mood wedding rings. Yeah. He came up with the idea after seeing a physician friend apply thermotropic tape to a kid's forehead to measure temperature. And yes, they used to do this. I don't know if they still do, but if you were sick and you felt like you had a fever, there was this time period where instead of like using a normal thermometer, they would like put something to your head and see what the color would show. So that was his inspiration for mood rings. The mood ring was one of the biggest fashion fads of the 1970s. Each mood ring contained a temperature sensitive liquid crystal encased in quartz. As the body temperature of the wearer changed, the crystals would change colors. Each color the ring displayed supposedly corresponded to a different mood. So let's just briefly talk about what each color would mean. Amber meant nervous or unhappy. Green was like the average color that people would get. It was a pretty popular color. It meant calm, relaxed, average. Blue meant that your emotions were charged active, deep thinking, intense. Violet or pink meant you're passionate, excited, very happy, or romantic. Red meant that you're angry or stressed. Black meant that you're tense or nervous. It also could have meant a broken crystal, which we'll talk about in a second. And gray meant strained, anxious, afraid, and exhausted. And apparently gray is the most rare color to get on a mood ring. And I mean, I had mood rings all throughout my childhood and I never got gray. I would usually get like pink and red and green. Now you're probably wondering, how accurate are these things really? And from a scientific perspective, the ring changes color based on your body temperature, which sometimes could indicate mood. It says, for example, if you're under stress, your body directs your blood towards your internal organs, which means less blood is reaching your finger. So that would change the color accordingly. Another example is that when you're excited, more blood will flow to your fingers because your heart is pumping, which would then in turn change the color of the ring. So it's really more about your body temperature than your mood, but I guess they could coincide in a way. It would also depend on where you are. Are you out in the winter cold? Are you out on a hot beach? And what a lot of people don't know is that mood rings can be completely destroyed if you put them underwater, which is something I wish I knew as a kid because you know, kids are like curious. I remember I used to have them all the time and I would go and like wash my hands and see how the color would change. That's not good, that will destroy it. So basically the inventor of the mood ring made an absolute fortune off of it. Like millions and millions would sell each year. But what's funny is that after that whole craze was over, he went and invented the thigh master exercise machine. So it's, <laughs> it's a little bit different than a mood ring. And I mean, good for him. It seems like he's an awesome inventor. It's just funny how like mood ring, thigh master. It's just so different, you know? In 2004, a woman created a mood collar for pets intended to improve their emotional health. So she made this collar so you can tell like what your pet was thinking and feeling. They even have mood ring toilet seats now and a mood ring Xbox controller. So people really took this mood ring thing and put it on like every single item. So now here's the kind of weird fact that not a lot of people realized. Mood rings actually have a lifespan. They don't 
last forever, they die. <laughs> Did you like, mood rings die. Apparently the heat sensitive crystals inside of the mood ring can only change color for a period of two years maximum. And once they couldn't change color anymore, they would just turn black. So basically if your mood ring turns black, it either means that you're tense and anxious or it's dead. And people weren't prepared for this and it kind of freaked them out. I mean, imagine wearing it every single day and seeing it change to these beautiful bright colors depending on your mood. And then one day you wake up and it's just like, Black? I would like think I was dead or something. So now let's get into some creepier facts. Many people may not know that mood rings can be used for spirit communication. I don't know why every single thing seems to lead back to communicating with spirits, but that's just how it goes. I don't know why. Here we are yet again. So basically, the different colors that appear on your ring represents different answers. Because if you think about it, your ring changes depending on your energy, right? And spirits seem to be the no it alls of how to control energy. So some people will literally just sit down and be like, hey, if there's any spirit in the room, change my ring color to red. And if that happens, there's a spirit in the room. Some people will even tie their mood ring to a string and use it as a pendulum. A pendulum usually refers to any weighted object that can swing back and forth. These are usually used for paranormal reasons. So the psychic or medium would hold the string with the object on the bottom and would ask a question and depending on which way the object swings, that's yes or no. So some paranormal investigators find it cool to have the yes or no on the pendulum but also the color change. So the spirit can answer a question but also show their emotion. It's all a lot. It's a lot, you know. Other people will even go as far as casting a spell onto their mood ring just to help the spirit communicate with the colors. There are even websites out there where you can buy a mood ring that already has a spell cast on it so you don't have to do the work. <laughs> and obviously I would never encourage you guys to do these things. Please, please listen to me. I've said it a million times. It can be very dangerous to communicate with spirits. I'm just telling you guys the history and how things are used. I wanted to give examples of how mood rings have a darker side because you just wouldn't expect it. But like, don't do any of this stuff, please, okay? Let's talk about some pretty controversial mood ring recalls. There have been tons of dangerous recalls over the years. And it's because almost every year they are found to have toxic levels of lead. And I think this is because they've tried to make mood rings as cheap as possible to sell in places like dollar stores. So the cheaper the materials, the more lead you'll probably find in jewelry. And you know kids, they like to put everything in their mouth and it's just too toxic for their system. So for example, in 2004, 580,000 mood rings were recalled for toxic lead. And in 2005, 40,000 mood rings and mood necklaces called the love testers were also recalled. Those are just two examples. It happens all the time. I'm really hoping that now in 2019 they fix the problem. I hope so. To end this video, I'm going to be telling you guys a story about a haunted mood ring. This is not my story. This is an article I found online. It's from an anonymous author, so I don't know. It's kind of spooky. So it's about this girl who got a mood ring for her birthday back in 2006 when she was 11 years old. She would wear it absolutely everywhere because just like me, she was fascinated with the fact that it could turn colors throughout the day. One day she randomly decided to place this mood ring on the hand of one of her porcelain dolls in her bedroom. As soon as she put this ring on her doll, it instantly turned a bright red color, which as you guys saw would mean like anger and being tense. It's usually associated with like bad energy. So she took it off the doll's hand and immediately it turned back to like a nice green color. So she decided to put this ring on her other dolls just to see if maybe the red color was normal. But when she tested that theory, they all stayed green on her other dolls. But this one doll, it would turn red the second it was put on there. She was so afraid by this that she refused to keep this doll in her room any longer. And from that day forward, whenever Whenever she got a doll as a gift, she would first take her mood ring and put it onto the doll to make sure it was safe enough to be in her room. If it ever turned red, she did not want to keep the doll. So I guess technically the mood ring wasn't haunted, it was more like the doll that was haunted, but I don't know guys. That is so creepy. <laughs>
The Magic 8 Ball is a toy used for fortune telling or seeking advice. It was developed in the 1950s and is manufactured by Mattel. If you guys didn't know, Mattel is the same company that makes Barbie and all kinds of other toys that you know and love. The user asks a yes or no question to the large plastic ball and then it turns over to reveal a written answer which appears on the surface of the toy. The Magic 8 Ball is styled after a billiards ball and it has about 20 different answers that it can give you. So you can basically ask this toy absolutely anything that you wanted. Does my crush like me? Will I get 100% on my math test? Literally anything you can think of, you ask this ball, shake it up, and it will reveal an answer to you. A lot of people take this toy very seriously and a lot of people use it just for fun. But let's go back in time a little bit farther. The device was invented by Albert C. Carter. It was actually inspired by the fact that his mother was a clairvoyant. A clairvoyant is someone with the ability to experience psychic phenomena in a visual way, and that could be through a dream or literal visions while you're awake. She also claimed that she could communicate with ghosts. So because his mother was always communicating with the unknown or the other side, as you may put it, he wanted to create a toy that kind of mimicked that. So a lot of people don't know it was inspired by very paranormal reasons. And in modern day now, the Magic 8 Ball is used all the time at sleepovers, at parties. And like I said, people think it's such an innocent little toy, but if you go back into its history, it has a lot of darker meaning. Now, I have a personal little creepy story that has to do with a Magic 8 Ball. It happened to me when I was pretty young. I believe I was in grade three and someone gave this Magic 8 Ball to me as a gift while I was at school. I can't remember what the occasion was. Maybe it was my birthday or something. I just remember being so excited that someone would gift this to me because everyone else in my class was always playing with them. On the bus ride home from school, I was just sitting there constantly asking it questions and shaking it up and seeing what it would say. And it would just like reveal the answer. It was like magic to me. It was so weird. I don't really see a lot of kids playing with these anymore. I think it was definitely more popular um, in the 90s and before that. But my friends at school would also sit with me and ask it questions. But what was weird was I noticed that the questions went from being innocent and silly to more dark and sinister the more questions they asked. For example, people started asking it, am I gonna die before I'm 20? Is this bus going to crash? Is there a ghost here that wants to talk to us? And I do remember feeling a little bit uncomfortable because the questions started to get so weird and morbid. When I got home and I was walking through the house up to my bedroom holding this magic eight ball, I walked by my mom and the second she saw me carrying this magic eight ball, she was like, no, 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 no. Where are you going with that? She like rushed over to me, grabbed it from my hands and she was like, you cannot have that. Her face was terrified and she was like, please tell me you haven't used this yet. And that's a really scary thing to hear from your parent when you know the whole entire day you had been using it. I told her I was using it and I asked her what was so wrong and she she told me that something very bad happened to her when she was a kid, but she didn't want to talk to me about it. She basically took the magic ball away from me. I have no idea where she put it, but I had never seen it again since that day. Over the next few days, I was just so confused and anxious and curious about what she couldn't tell me. And each day I would walk up to her and be like, mom, please tell me what's wrong. Like what happened when you were a kid? So she finally sat down with me and told me about a story about a time her her and her friends were using a Ouija board at a Halloween party and things went really, really wrong. She was using it to try to communicate with a friend of hers that passed away, but she ended up communicating with a really evil spirit who she thought was her best friend. It's a very complicated story with her and the Ouija board, but it scarred her for life and the experience was so dark and evil. I actually did a whole story about this Ouija board experience on my channel like four years ago. I will link that video down below in the description for you guys to watch after if you want to, but she basically told me that a magic eight ball is very similar to a Ouija board if you're using it to communicate with spirits. It's like a Ouija board in disguise. So basically since I was a kid, I've always been afraid of Ouija boards and magic eight balls. And it might seem silly. You might be like, Jess, it's literally just a toy. But I feel like any device, it could be a toothbrush. If you're using it to communicate with the spirit, they will latch onto that. Because think about it. I believe spirits are all around us constantly and they will
will jump onto anything that will allow them to communicate with us and to get a grasp of like the real life world. And the fact that the Magic 8 Ball was used for that purpose back when it was invented. I mean, even spirit boxes make me nervous because you're still communicating with the dead. And it doesn't mean that every time you're using a Magic 8 Ball, it means you're communicating with spirits. It's all about how you use it. You know what I mean? The next interesting fact that I'm kind of excited about is that there is a Magic 8 Ball horror movie actually coming out. It's being made right now. Bloom House, which is a noted horror studio, will actually produce the film. And they partnered with Mattel, the company that's making these Magic 8 Balls to make this film. Bloom House previously partnered with Hasbro to create a movie based on the Ouija board. And that movie earned more than 103 million at the global box office. So a movie about a Magic 8 Ball might do well as well, seeing as the Ouija board one did too. I feel Feel like if you make a movie about any sort of nostalgic toy that people know, it's gonna do well. I mean, think about my nostalgic series on YouTube. You guys love that because you like nostalgia. You like remembering things. So let's move on to some silly fortune telling toys and fortune telling devices. Because as sinister and as creepy as the Magic 8 Ball and the Ouija board is, there are also ones that have been made for kids that are a little bit silly and peculiar. First, we have the fortune telling fish. It's basically this little tiny thin piece of material that you cut out and make a fish. You put it on the palm of your hand, you just lay it flat down, and if the fish curls on your hand, it like means different things about your personality. It's kind of confusing. It says if the head of the fish curls up, it means you're jealous. <laughs> like what? If the head and the tail curl up, it means you're in love. If the sides of the fish curl, it means you're fickle. What is fickle? Like stubborn? If the fish actually flips over on your hand, you have a false personality, so aka you're super fake. And what's creepy is that it says if the fish doesn't move at all, it means you're dead. <laughs> what? And the reason why it's silly is because the only way that the fish is moving on your hand depends on how sweaty your palm is, or at least that's what I've read. The material will like suck up your sweat and curl in different ways, so there's nothing magical behind it. It's literally how your body works, basically. The next toy is called Ask Xandar. It's a board game manufactured by Milton Bradley in 1992. So it's more of a high-tech battery-powered version of the Magic 8-Ball. A little sillier too. The gameplay involved reading questions aloud to Xandar, trying to guess what he would answer, and then waving your hand over his crystal ball to find out if you were right. And basically, if you guessed right, he would tell you your future. This next one I'm pretty sure everybody has seen and knows. It is the Zoltar machine. Zoltar is the famous animatronic fortune teller found in arcades, theme parks, gift shops, homes, and various attractions around the world. I know that I used to see these machines all the time as a kid when I was at the mall with my parents, and they actually kind of used to scare me. I mean, some of them had like legit red glowing eyes. <laughs> Like, why? Are you trying to scare us or entice us? Next, we have the vintage palm reading machines. These were really popular in the 1980s, and for just 50 cents, it would tell you your palm reading. It would, like, light up with psychedelic colors and sounds, and it would always be this really soft female voice. I just remember I used to be so freaked out walking past these machines because I guess they had, like, motion detectors or something, and the second it would sense you, it would, like, talk to you. It would, like, try and get you to use a machine, it would be like, come here, I will read your fortune, give me your palm, and I will tell you about your life. And you'd be like, no, I'm just trying to shop, like, leave me alone. Cereal box toys became a staple of breakfast dating back as far as the 1940s. Apparently the first cereal brand to ever put a prize into their box was from the brand Kellogg's. They tried to entice kids to eat cornflakes with the offer of a free book. This book was called the Funny Jungle Land Moving Pictures Book and this was put in boxes in the early 1900s and people were astonished astonished by this because they had never bought food with something else in it. I mean, when I was a kid, I was so shocked that you can get DVDs in your cereal, you could get computer games in your cereal. I mean, those were the good days. You could get your favorite movie for the price of cornflakes. I mean, I remember one day I got this computer game in my cereal called Freddy the Fish, I believe. It was a game I was obsessed with and played every day after school, and it was 
actually a really creepy game now that I think back to it. But what's really sad about all of this is that nowadays it's actually illegal to put any prizes into a cereal box. So my viewers that are very young, you've probably never experienced a prize in your cereal. The reason why they had to stop doing this was mostly because of lawsuits. These prizes were dangerous, they had to be recalled, kids were injured. We're gonna get into all of this. So let's start with the alleged lawsuits. I always like to say that everything I'm talking about are facts I found online and have not been confirmed to me by any of these brands. I have not spoken with them, I'm just relaying what I found on the internet. I don't want to get in trouble by cereal brands. So one of the causes for many lawsuits was pieces of the prize or toy falling apart into people's cereal and then they eat them. A lot of the toys that were given had tiny little parts that would fall off. For example, in the year 2000, they had to recall 800,000 little toy cars. The reason why is because the wheels of the car were falling off into kids' cereal and they were consuming them. So obviously that is a choking hazard for anybody eating cereal. In 1988, there was a massive recall for 30 million flutes and binoculars because apparently they too were also deemed as a choking hazard. And then in 2004, there was a wristwatch shaped Spidey Signal toy that used a mercury power battery that had the chance of leaking into your cereal. So basically people had poisonous Spider-Man in their cereal boxes. And then another reason why they can no longer put prizes into cereal is just because of the cost. It's really expensive for people to put a toy and a cereal in the same box. So let's talk about some scary things that have been found in cereal boxes. First we have metal fragments that were found in Wheaties cereal. They are microscopic and are meant to make the breakfast cereal more nutritious because by adding these metal fragments to the cereal, it automatically will have more iron. What is really disturbing to me is that the cereal can actually be picked up by magnets. You can find pictures of people doing this, you can go and search on YouTube and find videos of people picking up Wheaties with magnets. I mean, do you really want your children eating breakfast cereal that could be picked up? by magnets? And like, this was all legal, you know? It passed all the health requirement tests. I mean, how is that allowed? Next, we have slap bracelets. I have mentioned this whole controversy in another video before, but basically they were putting slap bracelets into cereal boxes, and when they had the plastic ones, it was totally fine to use, but once they started to make cheap metal slap bracelets, the sides of the metal started to get very sharp and kids were actually hurting themselves when they were slapping the bracelet onto their arm. So a ton of those were recalled and a ton were actually banned from being used in schools. The next thing is the iron-on patches and these were sold in the honeycomb cereal packs. Obviously companies didn't really think this through because I feel like a child should not be handling a hot iron and there were a lot of cases where kids were getting injured trying to iron these patches onto their clothing. Next we have the Kinder Surprise Eggs. What's crazy is that these Kinder Surprise Eggs were such a big part of my childhood. I remember like getting one every single Friday as a treat after school and they just made people so happy so it's hard to imagine something so great being so dangerous. Apparently three UK children died after choking on the toys inside of the Kinder Egg and these are actually completely illegal in the United States. What's crazy to me is that it says two Seattle men attempted to smuggle these Kinder Eggs across the border and they were fined $2,500 per egg and apparently they had six of them. So that is a lot of money for a thing of chocolate. I kind of want to do a video on the dangerous toys that were inside the Kinder Eggs, but that would be a whole other thing. But whenever they were put in cereal boxes, obviously the choking hazard 
was there. The next dangerous toy in cereal boxes were popper toys. I also remember these. These eye poppers seem harmless, but a total of 36 children actually suffered major eye injuries. I remember these eye poppers really used to scare me because it would be so suspenseful. You would have to push it down onto a table and wait for it to suddenly pop. And I can see how that would like hit kids' faces and stuff. That's terrible. Then there was the Apple Jacks ghost detector. I can't believe they actually put a paranormal item into cereal back then. That's so cool. This prize came out in cereal in 1989. It says, according to the box, if the ghost detector moved around on your hand, it meant there were ghosts in your room. And a lot of kids were getting spooked by this because I mean, it was a tiny little piece of paper. Of course it's gonna move. You have vents in your room, you might have windows open so a ton of kids were really scared by this. So let's now talk about weird cereal boxes. This first one was called Mr. Muscle and if you turn over the box you can see a heart monitor reading on the back. Basically before you eat Mr. Muscle you have a normal heart rate and once you eat it your heart is like heart attack rate. The way this was being advertised is to give you like a ton of energy in the morning after you eat it but it sounds kind of uh suspicious to me. This next cereal box is called Grins and Smiles and Giggles and Laughs. What a weird name. So this box design really disturbed people because it's so confusing. If you look at the front of the box, they have created some horrifyingly disfigured machine. It has an ear by its mouth and a bone sticking out of his head. If you look at its face, it obviously looks like it's in pain and yet the people around around it are laughing at its misery. What a weird description and illustration for a box. Next is Crispy Critters. It's a cereal box that had a two-headed llama as its mascot, and the cereal inside of it was actually a two-headed llama, which was so crazy back then. I feel like instead of Crispy Critters, it should have been like Creepy Critters. Then there was a box called Freakies. This came out in 1973, and the Freakies were tight types of weird creature monster things and they had very strange names. For example, there was Snorkeldorf, Cow Mumble, Ham Hose, Boss Moss, Goody Goody, Gargle, and Grumble and each had its own distinct personality. They had commercials that went out between 1974 and 1975 and I can't find them anywhere but apparently they were very very bizarre commercials. These last two things are just weird facts about cereal in general. Apparently there was a fourth brother in the Snap, Crackle, and Pop trio. Isn't that crazy? Like, I always thought Rice Krispies only had the three brothers, but there was a fourth. What happened to him? It says the Rice Krispies clan actually had a fourth elf named Pow. At one point, the brother made a brief appearance on the boxes in 1950, but then for some reason disappeared after that and he was never seen again. I don't know if maybe they thought four mascots was too much. I don't know if he got like a bad rep. I don't really know what happened to the fourth brother, but he is no longer anywhere. And lastly, there was a very scary commercial that I think had to be banned and pulled off the air because kids were like crying about it. It was for post cereal. And I have no idea why they thought this commercial would be kid friendly because it's literally a clown. But it was so disturbing, parents were complaining about it so they eventually got rid of it. But oh my goodness, what a horrible marketing idea. <laughs> Okay, so for a little background on them in case you guys have no idea what they are, they're basically really small people. Polly Pockets are the best selling miniature dolls in the entire world. They are almost four inches tall, so I don't know how I can, I think they were like that tall, right? They're plastic and they come with these really like gooey plasticky clothes. I mean, they're not gooey clothes, but I remember as a kid they felt so sticky to put onto my doll. It kind of gave a new spin on dolls because up until that point they had Barbie and baby dolls and they all had normal material for clothes. And this was the first time any doll had a weird plastic material for their skirt, for their dress, for their top. It was just so rubbery and I feel like it really intrigued people. Especially 
especially because of their size as well. Now, I'm pretty sure the first ones that ever came out were super, super small. They literally came in a little case that you can open and they were like that tiny. And then a bit later on, they came out with Fashion Polly and those are the ones that are almost four inches tall. So we have like teeny, 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 tiny and slightly bigger Polly Pocket. They were invented in 1983 by Chris Wiggs and he was basically looking to create a doll for his daughter that was small enough to carry around and to put in her pocket. So the first Polly Pocket he ever made, he actually put into a makeup powder container, which is crazy. So he made the tiny dolls in there for his daughter. She absolutely loved it. And that's sort of how they started to be made. Now, it wouldn't be a Jessie B video unless we got into the creepy, disturbing stuff. So basically, there was a massive recall on Polly Pockets. Like literally thousands, almost millions of cases around the world had to be recalled and sent back to the store. Oh my goodness, it says they recalled 4.4 million Polly Pocket cases. That's basically from the whole world. So the original cases have really, really tiny dolls and at the very bottom of their feet, they have magnets and that allows you to place the dolls wherever you want in the case. And so many kids around the world were swallowing these magnets because kids are strange. And your body can't digest magnets and the way magnets work is they stick together. So if they're in your body and they're like sticking together and all your body parts are clinging together, it's not a healthy situation. There were a couple hundred reports of these magnets falling off the dolls and children eating them. So many kids were hospitalized, especially if they swallowed more than one magnet. It says tons of kids suffered intestinal perforation that required surgery. Imagine literally having surgery because your Polly Pocket almost killed you. I just have a question. Why do kids put everything in their mouth? It feels like it's it's like my dog. Like my dog Winnie, no matter what you drop on the floor, even if it's not food, she's like, I want to eat that. They actually have a recalled list of what exact sets were recalled. So if you have any of these sets, these were very dangerous back in the day. You're actually not supposed to own these. So if you do, shh, and don't eat the magnets. So the recalled sets are Holly Place Hanging Out House, Polly Place Treetop Clubhouse, Quick Click City Pretty Play Set. This is literally a tongue twister. Spa Day, Quick Click Boutique, Quick Click Sporty Style Play Set, and Totally Zen Play Set. So most things that have click in it are insinuating that you take the magnet and click it into the play set. So don't be clicking into your intestines, people. So let's get into some creepy stuff, but it's also really awesome. There are some horror themed Polly Pocket sets and it's people who are super creative that actually sculpt Polly Plock, Polly Plock it. Polly Plocket. People out there who are artists have sculpted Polly Pocket horror themed play sets. For example, someone posted on Reddit with the username I Love Sheep123, and they posted the Adams Family version of Polly Pocket, which I find so cool. Literally, if this person has an Etsy account and any of you guys know, please comment it down below because, like, I would literally purchase this. They also did a Beetlejuice Polly Pocket house and they did a Nightmare Before Christmas one. So it's literally a miniature versions of these horror films and I'm just like obsessed. By the way, the other day someone commented on my video and they were like, Beetlejuice is not a horror movie, it's just a comedy. And I was like, can it not be both? I don't know, I've always thought that anything Tim Burton was just like automatically a horror movie even though there's tons of comedy in it. But we're not here to talk about Beetlejuice even though I would love to. So let's talk about the rare Polly Pockets. Now when I was researching this, this absolutely blew my mind. Polly Pockets are selling for so much on eBay like literally up to $10,000. So here are some examples of some rare ones in case you have it. And I'm so upset about the first one because I literally had this one. If you have this Polly Pocket car in its original packaging from 2008, it's selling for $10,000 in the UK right now. Whoa. Also, there's a 1996 sealed jewel case set going for $2,000 in Australia. So that's also a lot of money. There's the Magical Mansion set, which a lot of people found to be the coolest Polly Pocket set ever made. There's a spinning dance floor, the roof lights up. Everybody loved this set. Then there's the Fairy Light Wonderland one that is selling for about $500 on eBay. There's a Bouncy Castle set going for $200. And there's a Disney Alice in Wonderland and 
Little Mermaid set, which is going for $2,000, and that came out in 1996. So like, Polly Pockets, the rare ones go for a lot of money. I sold mine at a garage sale. <laughs> I know I keep saying that in every video, but I literally sold all of my rare toys in a garage sale. Okay, the next thing that I find really weird is that they came out with Polly Pocket makeup at Hot Topic. I don't know how I feel about this. It says that Hot Topic just released their own Polly Pocket inspired makeup, brushes, and bags. So it's to kind of give you the 90s nostalgia feeling when you buy this stuff. It says the palettes are actually shaped and open exactly like the old Polly Pocket cases. Okay, that's honestly like kind of cool. They also have a lip palette, Polly Pocket brush. Like it's, it's kind of interesting. I have no idea how well this makeup works, but if I have to be honest with you, I did buy it. I went on the Hot Topic website and bought a Polly Pocket makeup brush set. Um, I got the eyeshadow, I got the brushes, and I think I'm gonna do like a Polly Pocket makeup tutorial on my vlog channel, but I have to wait for that to come in, but honestly, I'm somewhat excited. And the last thing we're gonna talk about is the creepy baby set for Polly Pocket. So there was this little case set called Baby Time Fun, and it's like a nursery set, and basically when you open it, it's filled with tiny Pony, pony Pocket. Can I not speak? It's filled with tiny Polly Pocket babies, like filled. And if you thought the normal dolls were small, these babies were like this big. Like, they're like the size of a pea. So obviously kids were like swallowing them. It's not as bad as swallowing magnets, but apparently people kept losing these babies. Like they were dropping in the middle of car seats and like on the road and under couches. So even though this set came out a long time ago, people are still finding these tiny babies all over their house. It's creepy and weird. <laughs> So back in 1914, there was this little girl named Marcella, and she had a father who was an illustrator, a cartoonist, an artist, and his name was Johnny Gruel. One day she ran into her father's art studio and told him that she found a faceless doll in her grandmother's attic. She really wanted to keep this faceless doll, but it did look a little bit creepy. So her father picked up his cartooning pen and drew this happy little face on the doll for his daughter. And then afterwards, she had her grandmother mother sew these button eyes onto the doll. Reminds me of Coraline. He then wanted to come up with this name for the doll. So he looked at a bunch of these poems that he had lying around on his desk and he compressed two titles of his all-time favorite poems. One was called The Raggedy Man and one was called Little Orphan Annie. So when he combined the two together it became Raggedy Ann. He asked his daughter if she liked that name and she said yes. Now this origin story really differs depending on who you ask. Some people People think the father was actually the one who found the doll and decided to gift it to his daughter. No one knows 100% for sure. Regardless though, Marcella played with this doll every single day. She absolutely adored it. So her father thought that if she loved it so much, surely many other kids around the world would love it as well. So on September 1915, he came out with a design patent and began creating hundreds of dolls to give to children. But there is a much darker twist to this story. In 1921, when Marcella was only 13 years old, she was given the smallpox vaccine at school without her parents' permission. Well, the rumor is that she became ill from the vaccine and died months later, and her body was completely limp like a rag doll. It is said that her father started mass producing these Raggedy Ann dolls because it reminded him of the way Marcella died, like a rag doll. But this part of the story was proven to be false. Now, Marcella did in fact pass away after receiving the smallpox vaccine vaccine. But it turned out it wasn't from the vaccine itself. It was from the needle not being properly sterilized, causing bacteria to build up around the injection site. They didn't have proper antibiotics or sterilization tools back then, so that's what led to her dying from the bacteria from the injection site, not the vaccine itself. I don't want to make a video scaring people about vaccines, okay? Back then things were very different. It's not something we need to worry about in this day and age. Anyways though, her father didn't mask produced the dolls because of the way she died, but because it reminded him of all the happy times with his daughter. He wanted her memory to live on forever. Now, what I find interesting about the original Raggedy Ann dolls is that they had brought
brown hair and they looked very different to what they look like now. Now they have these bright red hair and you can always recognize them when you see them. And apparently the original dolls are worth $5,000 now, which is insane. Okay, I wanted to complete this video with this scary story that I found. Apparently it's a true story, but it sounds kind of scary to be one. It's called the six foot doll. This is a story from 1980. It's about this nine year old girl. Her name was Skylar and she got this very odd gift for Christmas one year. Her aunt walked into the house pushing a giant box in front of her that almost touched the ceiling. Now Skylar had no idea what it was and couldn't wait to open it. So she ran over and with the help of her parents, she opened the box and inside sat the biggest Raggedy Ann doll that she had ever seen in her life. It was six feet tall and apparently her aunt had made it herself. It was like a hand stitched custom Raggedy Ann doll. Now as sweet as this gift was, there was something eerie about looking up at a Raggedy Ann doll that was just staring down back at her. She put the doll in the corner of her bedroom and when the lights were off in her room, it looked like a giant monster just sitting there staring at her. I think the creepiest part of this girl's experience is that she said, some night she would hear the doll softly chuckling. And when she told her parents about it, they said that she was probably just hearing the sounds of the vents rattling or cars outside. But Skylar was so sure that the doll knew she was scared of it and was laughing at her at night because of that. In the darkness, she could almost see the shadow of the doll just slightly moving its shoulders up and down as it snickered. Now the doll only lasted one month in her room until they had to move it to storage because it was scaring her that much, like this poor girl. I mean, I don't know how I would feel about receiving a six foot doll, no matter what kind of doll it was, raggedy iron, porcelain doll. Dolls are creepy in general. I don't want a jumbo one. <laughs> We're gonna be talking about troll dolls today because as you guys know, I love nostalgia. And I know in recent years, like in the past five years, there's been like new troll dolls and new troll movies. I'm not gonna be talking about those. I'm gonna be talking about the ones that were around when I was a kid because I know nothing about the new stuff. I am talking about the OG ones. And believe it or not, those came out in the 50s. So we're gonna start with the history, the weird facts, you guys know the drill. And then we're gonna move on to the creepier stuff. So let's jump right into the history. Believe it or not, the first troll dolls were actually wooden. A man named Thomas Dam had a talent for carving figures out of wood. He started making little gifts for his children that included these cute little troll dolls. So he began to sell them door to door. The word of these really cool wooden items got around the town and soon there was a high demand. So he opened a factory and began making them out of rubber. And by the end of the 50s, he was selling more than 10,000 troll in Denmark each year. So the popularity of these ramped up so, so fast, and it started from just this small business. So if you guys didn't know, trolls are originally from Scandinavian folklore. Stories of trolls have been told in various fairy tales, but their primary characteristics have always been their extreme ugliness. In their mythology, they often live under bridges or in the mountains. They spend their time tricking humans out of money, and they're always hideous. So that is why the creator of these dolls made them with wrinkly faces, bulbous noses, and oversized ears, but he still managed to make them adorable as well. He literally said that he hoped people would find these dolls so ugly that they would laugh. And he says he really wants to make people smile. So he actually wanted to make them ugly. That's so weird. And speaking of trolls under the bridge, when my sister and I were little, my grandparents would take us on these hikes through a forest. And there was this one point in the middle of the forest where there was this creek running through it and over this creek was this big wooden bridge and my grandma would stop before we crossed the bridge and she would say this bridge is owned by a scary troll he lives under it and will eat anybody that crosses it and my sister and I would be like so freaked out and she said the only way we could make it across is if we stomped our feet over the bridge and chanted troll under the bridge troll under the bridge troll under the bridge. And we literally did that every single time. I just had to mention it because it reminded me of that. But yeah, creepy bridge trolls is basically where the troll dolls were inspired from. So let's talk about their hair because that's like the most iconic part about them. The troll's wild crazy hair has become their trademark. The Icelandic sheep's wool used and glued on the tops of the dolls for a bushy exaggerated mane. People have said that it's strangely soothing to the touch. And eventually they went from making it sheep's wool 
available to just synthetic hair. This was because the demand for these toys were just too, too high. They were using way too much sheep's wool. So because these dolls were so popular, there were some copycats. By the early 1960s, trolls were a huge international trend. And because of their immediate success, knockoff trolls showed up on shelves all over America. Their names were Wishnicks, Fawny Trolls, and Lucky Schnooks. I've never heard of any of those three brands, but they're copycats. So a weird fact is that there is a real troll museum. There's a woman in Ohio named Singrid, and she calls herself the Troll Queen. She actually claims herself that she is a troll just being disguised as a human, and she has used her passion for the creatures to amass a collection of nearly 3,000 unique trolls, setting a Guinness World Record. So she's created this huge museum with all of these trolls. She's called it the Troll Hole, and currently there are 18,000 trolls in there. It's a lot of trolls. And she apparently gives guided tours there once a day for 10 bucks, so pretty cool stuff. And then, as you guys probably know, DreamWorks came out with a movie in 2016, which I haven't seen. Not really into that stuff. All right, let's talk about some two really creepy stories that have to do with trolls. The first one is called The Haunted Troll on eBay. So much like a paranormal game, if it exists, it's probably on eBay and it's probably haunted. It's crazy, you can go on eBay and literally type in anything haunted and it will be there. You could put like haunted piano, haunted couch, haunted light bulb, there'll be one there. So one day someone posted a listing of a troll doll that they said was very haunted and they wanted to get rid of it ASAP. They actually said in quote, it's ruining our lives. The person named this troll doll Beast and said that one day it just showed up at her front door in a basket. There was no note and she had no idea who it was from, but she assumed it was just from one of her neighbors to give as a gift to her kid. She had a little girl who was five years old at the time. Now the troll doll looked a little bit weird. Some of its hair was pulled out parts of the rubber on its body was all scraped and one of its eyes were missing but her daughter still really really wanted it even though it looked so weird so they kept it and it didn't take long for weird things to start happening the mother put this troll doll on a shelf in her daughter's room over her bed and the first night she woke up to her screaming and saying that it fell off the shelf and hit her face and the next night the same thing happened again so this troll would just literally fling itself off the shelf and land on this little girl's face. So the mother just thought it was a coincidence and said that her daughter might as well just sleep with the troll doll in the bed so it wouldn't fall on her. But this time she woke up claiming the doll started pulling her hair and wouldn't let her sleep. So they put the doll in her toy chest. But the girl woke up again and said the doll was knocking on the top of the toy chest trying to get out. So the mom completely moved the doll out of the room. She put it into the basement storage. But in the morning the doll was standing at her bedroom door. So in the eBay listing, she says that no matter where she puts it in the house, it keeps trying to get closer and closer to the little girl, which is so creepy. So she's begging for somebody to take it. It's not up on eBay anymore. So I don't know if she gave up or if someone actually bought it from her, but it's a very creepy story. And the next story is called the troll doll profile picture. There's a story about this girl who lived on a farm and was randomly messaged by this strange Facebook account back in 2010. This account had no pictures, no posts, no information on it. The only visible thing she could see was that its profile picture was that of a troll doll. And what was even weirder was that this message she received from this strange account was a riddle. This is what the riddle said. I have hundreds of ears, but I can't hear a thing. What am I? And she was so confused by this and did not want to answer him. But the whole rest of her day, she was thinking about the answer to this riddle. How could something have ears but not hear anything? So she asked her family and friends, but they told her to just forget about it. You know, there's always going to be strange people on the internet. But the next day, the troll doll account messaged her again. This time saying, I'm going to stay where I am until you figure it out. So as you can imagine, she was starting to get a little bit more anxious about it. Why would she care? about where this person was and if they stayed or left. Why was that her problem? So she looked at the riddle again. I have hundreds of ears, but I can't hear a thing. What am I? Still not sure what the answer was. She went about her day, try not to think about it. But in the evening when she was lying in bed, it suddenly came to her, a cornfield. 
that was the answer. Well, she lived on a farm, and the neighboring field to her house was a cornfield. A chill went down her spine, and she walked over to her window. She looked outside, and standing in the cornfield was a shadowed figure of a man, not moving, just looking up at her window. She screamed and called the police, but when they arrived and looked through the cornfield with their flashlights, they couldn't find a man anywhere. The only thing they found sitting in the dirt was a troll doll. And that's how the story ended. I feel like it's a little bit cheesy just because like, why? Why the troll doll, you know? And also, why didn't she look up the riddle on Google? That's like the first thing I would have done if I was her. But I mean, this story is definitely more of a creepypasta, I'm assuming. I hope it is at least. Now, there are a couple of different theories about the origins of this toy. So let's start with the first theory. The Jack in the Box was popularized in the 15th and 16th century, and it was based on a very popular puppet named Punch from a famous puppet show called Punch and Judy. This puppet show was extremely popular and was played in public squares throughout England in the Middle Ages. So people say that the early Jack in the Box face looks very similar to this punch puppet. As you can imagine, back in the 15th and 16th century, people didn't really have a lot of entertainment. There was no TVs. There was no internet. There was nothing to really do aside from reading, writing, walking around. And for the younger kids, watching puppet shows was actually a really big thing. Even some adults watched puppet shows because they were very funny and just overall entertaining for them. So just like we have like the most popular shows on like Netflix and stuff nowadays. Back then they had the most popular puppet show, which was Punch and Judy. So people really think that the Jack in the Box started because of that puppet. And it's also interesting to note that the very first Jack in the Boxes were actually made out of wood and not metal or tin. Now let's move on to theory number two of the Jack in the Box origins. Another theory from the 16th century is that the name Jack was a reference to a dark spirit. People believe that you can actually capture dark spirits in objects like boxes. So the wooden box had a handle on the side that when cranked would play music until a jack or an evil spirit on a spring was suddenly released. So with this second theory, instead of, you know, this toy being fun and uplifting and like a great thing for kids, people actually used it to capture spirits and they thought that the jack in the box represented like a spirit coming out of the box, which is definitely a darker theory and I wouldn't have expected that at all. But back then, people were extremely superstitious. Word spread about this creepy legend with the Jack in the Box, which created a high demand for the toy, which is very strange. Once people found out there was like a paranormal element, they wanted it even more. And soon after, the tune Pop Goes the Weasel became the melody for this toy. And come on, you guys know that tune, right? Everyone knows that eerie tune that comes from a jack-in-the-box. But even the song is just so eerie and it almost puts you in suspense. It like rises and rises until it pops. In the 1930s, the Jack in the Box began to be made out of tin and the exterior of the boxes were stamped with images from nursery rhymes. And the Jack was sometimes changed to one of those characters featured in the rhymes. So for years and years, it had literally been the same Jack in a box. But in the 1900s, they decided that they could change the character to really anything they wanted. And then, as you guys know, in 1951, the first Jack in the Box hamburger stand was opened. And we're not gonna get into that because I actually did a whole other video on just Jack in the Box itself, like the restaurant. <laughs> and nowadays, Jack in the Boxes are linked with much creepier things like horror movies. Clowns and jesters used to be a source of entertainment back in the 15th and 16th century, but now they're actually a symbol of fear for many people. 
So let's move on with this video and just talk about creepy jack-in-the-box situations around the world. The first one is the world's largest jack-in-the-box. In Middletown, Connecticut sits the largest jack-in-the-box in the world. It's a 50-foot high contraption that has a giant clown head pop out of it once a minute. And guys, this clown head is 600 pounds. Are you kidding me? Not long after it was created, it became an eye-catching roadside attraction that began drawing curious visitors from all over the world. But as I was researching this giant jack-in-the-box, I found out that it was permanently closed for some mysterious reason. So if any of you guys are from here and know what actually happened, please comment that down below because I'm curious why they would close down such a giant attraction. But if you go on Google, it literally says permanently closed. All right, next let's talk about a paranormal jack-in-the-box the box game because guys basically if something exists there's a paranormal game for it so of course I looked up paranormal jack-in-the-box games and I found one that says after it gets dark outside you put the jack-in-the-box in the farthest room in your house and wind it up and you have to try and exit your house before the jack-in-the-box pops up or the evil spirit will remain in your house until you do it correctly so you literally have to to wind it up and run for your life out of the house before it springs up, which is so creepy. I mean, you don't want that jack spirit stuck in your house forever, no thank you. But thankfully, it does give you a few tries to do it correctly, so. I, of course, decided to buy a vintage jack-in-the-box on Amazon so I can actually play this game. So it should be arriving in the mail tomorrow, so that'll be up on my vlog channel. All right, so let's move on to a true creepy story called The Baby's Room. This is about an 18 year old mother who just had a baby and every night just like most babies It would cry and scream and keep her up most of the time But she discovered that when she let her baby play with the jack-in-the-box It would make her smile and giggle and would stop her from crying So this mother continued to do that every single night her baby was crying She would take out this jack-in-the-box and everything would be cool But about a week later she noticed that whenever her baby would cry the jack-in-the-box would crank itself up on its own and would play with the child without the mother even having to do that. So the mother would be like in bed listening to this toy constantly going off. This went on for several nights until finally the mother could not handle it anymore. She was too afraid. So they actually moved out of the house because she assumed there was something in her house that was doing that. I mean, at least it seems like maybe a positive spirit because it was trying to help out the baby. But but that's still probably a situation that you don't really want to be in. And lastly, I wanted to talk about a haunted jack-in-the-box that was listed on eBay. There was this listing where this woman was basically begging somebody to buy her old jack-in-the-box. She said she got it as a little girl back in the 50s, so this jack-in-the-box is pretty vintage. She got it from a clown at a festival. She said she was out with her parents and saw a clown that looked very sad sitting on a chair all by himself looking down at the ground and all the other clowns were up dancing and playing and being silly but this clown was like off on its own so she decided to walk over to him to cheer him up so she gave him a hug and the clown immediately started smiling and to thank her he reached into his bag and pulled out an old jack-in-the-box toy he told her it was very special to him and she could never lose it so throughout her life as she got older she almost felt obligated to keep it even though maybe she didn't really want to but she made sure to play with it throughout her childhood even throughout her teens but then you know once she's an adult and she's older she kind of started to forget about the toy a little bit she still kept it but she kept it away in storage but the older she got and the longer she ignored it the more it would randomly pop open without warning and in her old age jump scares weren't really a good thing for her so she decided to put it in storage in her garage hoping it would not bother her her anymore but in the middle of the night it would relentlessly play the jack-in-the-box tune so loud that she could hear it from her bedroom it was almost like the jack-in-the-box was begging her to play with it again so at this point she just wanted it gone and listed it on eBay now I can't find the listing anymore so either someone bought it or she gave up and took it down but I thought that story was pretty eerie 
Teddy Ruxpin was made in 1985 and was one of the very first animated talking toys ever created. He had motorized eyes and mouth and he told stories through a cassette player in his back. So people were fascinated when this teddy bear first came out because they had never seen one that actually talked and moved and told stories. This was like a new thing for the world. So once Teddy Ruxpin hit the shelves in stores, they immediately sold over a million units. There were lineups of parents fighting over buying this toy. It was insanity any store that you went to. Literally every parent wanted to buy this teddy bear for their kid and they would fight for it. In order to program the bear to move the way they wanted it to, they had to actually hire a puppeteer to help them. Now what's creepy is that the same puppeteer that worked on the Teddy Ruxpin bear actually worked on the Chucky doll in the horror movie. So if that doesn't say something, I don't know what does. The only problem with Teddy Ruxpin was that he was not made very well at all. And almost every single one that was bought broke within the first month. Basically the makers of this teddy bear tried to make it so so fast and put it out into stores that they didn't make it very well. The quality was terrible. So all of them kept breaking. So they decided to create this toy hospital for all the teddies that were breaking. So kids would send their bear there and they would repair it. Because the Teddy Ruxpin toy was such a big hit, they started selling more and more books that told kids about his crazy adventures. And because the books did so well, they decided to create a whole TV series. So you're probably wondering what ended up happening to Teddy Ruxpin because for about 10 to 15 years, they stopped selling him in stores. Basically in 1987, the company that created him went bankrupt. But then in 2017, a company called Wicked Cool Toys created an entirely new version of him. He's smaller and with electric blue eyes and he comes pre-programmed with three different stories and all the stories can be purchased through a mobile app. So they went from having this old motorized bear to having this like phone app. That's creepy. Now let's get into the creepier side of this teddy bear because people even way back in the 80s were experiencing some very strange and paranormal things. The first story is about a yard sale. There was this mother who was able to buy a teddy rex pin at a yard sale, but when they brought this teddy bear home, it quickly started to say things that it wasn't programmed to say. He started singing this very creepy song that went something like, touch my heart, you can talk to me, all your secrets and daydreams, see how fun it can be. Now that's not too creepy. I mean, it's a teddy bear singing a song, but then he started to say other things like, can I tell you a secret? Sometimes I feel very sad. What makes you feel sad? Now the creepiest thing he ever said was actually directed towards the mother. Now when the mother was a little girl, she accidentally set her childhood home on fire with matches. She was just playing around having fun and it turned into this huge devastating event. So what's creepy is that Teddy Ruxpin said to her, sometimes I like to play with matches even though I'm not supposed to. Have you ever played with fire? So that completely scared the mother. She started crying because obviously that reminded her of her childhood trauma. So they immediately put it into storage hoping they would never have to see it again. But from behind the closet you could hear, are you still there? I know you can hear me. So eventually they got rid of it all together. And when they complained to the company who actually made the bear, the company didn't believe them at all. Now, I don't know how true this story really is. It could be more of a creepy pasta, but it's definitely freaky. The next thing is that a lot of people were leaving reviews about how their Teddy Ruxpin's eyes would suddenly turn red. And while doing research for this video, I was surprised at how many people have complained about about this issue, it was almost like his blue eyes were glitching. There was this story about a babysitter who was looking after this four-year-old for the first time and this young kid owned a teddy ruxpin. She went to put him to bed and this kid insisted on having the teddy bear sleep with him. So she turned off his lights and went downstairs thinking everything was okay. But she suddenly heard the child scream from upstairs. So as she ran towards his room, she could see this red 
red light shining from under the door crack. And when she opened the door, all she could see was Teddy Ruxpin's red eyes glowing in the darkness beside this boy. And almost instantly they turned blue again and the bear said, bye bye, and turned off. Well, the babysitter could not get the kid to stop crying and when the parents came home, it just looked really bad on the babysitter's part. And of course the parents did not believe her that the eyes actually did turn red. Now in 2016, a YouTube channel called What's Inside actually opened up the inside of the Teddy Ruxpin bear and it was so weird to see what it actually looked like underneath the fur. It's like this creepy bear skeleton thing. So imagine just having that without the fur like sitting on a shelf in your room. No thank you. <laughs> now the Teddy Ruxpin bear actually made a cameo in the Paranormal Activity 3 movie. The premise of this movie is two siblings named Katie and Christy lived with their mother Julie and her boyfriend and paranormal situations trigger off in their house when the two girls befriend an invisible entity named Toby. And there's this one scene where the little girl is having a tea party and beside her on the chair is a Teddy Ruxpin. And I feel like that just shows you that the creators of this horror movie actually sees something eerie about this bear and wanted to have him in it as a cameo. They thought it would make a creepy touch and I think so too. And the last creepy thing is that these Teddy Ruxpin bears actually got hacked very often. There have been true stories about people that have had their bear sitting on their bed in their bedroom and suddenly this creepy low voice starts talking from their bear and it would actually start interacting with them, asking them weird questions and just acting bizarre, not the way it's programmed to act. Just like some people are able to hack into baby monitors or cameras, sometimes it's very easy to hack into toys as well. Like imagine being a kid just playing with your toy and all of a sudden it's like, hi, I can see you. That would scar me for life. I would never play with a toy again for real. Thank <laughs> you.